And good morning. It's time now for Coach's Corner, live from McDonald's on Madison Tilltop. I'm Tim Torch. Thanks for tuning us in this morning. We do it every Saturday morning from the McDonald's here across from the Madison High School. Talking boys basketball this morning. I've got first-year Shaw Memorial boys basketball coach Mike Browning. Coach, good morning to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you in, a veteran coach from the area. And, yeah, you're in the area coaching at Shaw. And I'm, I'm sure it's exciting for, for us as as basketball fans and broadcasters to see a, a, such a veteran coach come in got to be exciting for you to coach around here too it is you know I've, i started here with coach merrill mm -hmm. and uh there's just a lot of interest in coming back and yeah. and you know in a lot of ways i think most coaches would say that they would like to end up where they started sure sure especially if it's your hometown right your family's here and everything so mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting really why well, uh, uh, Coaching for you, you've been around a long time. I think uh, now your 31st year of coaching. What got you involved? Why Why did you want to, to be involved with coaching? You know, I, I've loved basketball since I was old enough to, to dribble and shoot. Mm -hmm. And, then, you know, playing for Coach Ritter in high school, I mean, that's as special as it gets, really, yeah. if you're a basketball player in this area. Right. And so I had a lot of interest in it. I tried to walk on my college team and made it for about a year and a half. But I was a little too small, a little too skinny. Yeah. And uh, I had an interest in coaching at, at Owensboro, at mm -hmm. Kentucky Wesleyan. They were starting their girls program for the first time. I helped with it a little bit. Kind of geared my classes to PE because I knew that's what I wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. And then really got out of it for a little while out of college and uh, came back here to Madison. Played in the open gyms with Coach Merrill's kids, mm -hmm. and uh, one night he he asked me. He said, "Are you doing anything after we're done?" And I said, "No." He said, "Let's go over to Wendy's and get a coke." And he said, "I've got an assistant coaching position open if you want it." Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the beginning. Yeah. And man, right away I I really liked what I was doing, mm -hmm. and uh, so. I just think love of basketball kind of leans you that way. Right. You know, guys that, that don't get to coach because they're in another profession tend to coach Little League and Bitty Ball, mm -hmm. and that helps some. Right. But mine is mine's big Bitty Ball. Yeah. So. You, uh, did you ever envision 31 years later? No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I didn't have any timetable on how long I would do it. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do it for a while. Yeah. Um, in 2002, when when uh, the class graduated at Paoli with Evan Seacat and those mm -hmm. guys, mm -hmm. my son was coming through school. He was a golfer, and I, I got out of it for a year mm -hmm. and thought maybe that'd be it. Yeah. But I knew when I went to basketball games, it probably wasn't. <laughs> so I didn't know it'd be this long, but I'm I'm happy it has been. Yeah, you uh, when you when you do this coaching thing and you you start kind of fallen to the point of where I really like going to work every day and doing this kind of hard to step away from it it is and, and you know it's one of those things you'll hear a lot of coaches say I think uh, as long as I'm healthy yeah and as long as you have good health and you can get up every morning excited about doing it mm -hmm. I, I think you continue to do it. and that, that's why there are so many coaches that are in their 30s and 40s um, man I've I was in a clinic about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Spoke at a clinic in French Lick, and the guy behind me was J.R. Holmes from mm -hmm. Bloomington South, sure. who I've known for a long time. And he said, "I'm in 48th year of coaching," and he said, "I'm going to at least make it to 50." That's a long time. That is a long time. So, I don't think I'm alone in it, but <laughs> I think uh, it's you're fortunate in coaching with with all the pressure and everything that goes on mm -hmm. to last that long. So yeah. that's probably more. A pride factor for me is I've, I've hung around, you know. Do you, the year you set out, was it tough? It was uh, good, mm -hmm. and it was tough. Yeah. It was. It was It was great in the summer <laughs> because I had nothing to do with following my son around playing golf. Yeah. Uh, it was nice in the fall. Started to get the itch about the time practice started. Yeah. I went and watched some college practices, and I, I went to some friends' practices and mm -hmm. saw a lot of high school games. And... Uh, I didn't know how long I would stay out, but I wanted to stay at Paoli until he graduated, so that was going to be three more years. Mm -hmm. And, man, right at the end of the next summer, I had been out a year and three months, 
and the girls job opened up with about a week before school mm -hmm. our girls coach left for a, a college job and I had a lot of friends that had girls on the team of course you know they're why don't you do it yeah so I committed to a year of it mm -hmm. and I ended up doing four <laughs> so, so and the only thing I'll tell you about girls is they listen a lot better well that was good you kind of brought me to my next yeah. question because when you said that I was going okay coaching guys and coaching girls and it's it's night and day a little bit it is and, and it's it's changing some now mm -hmm. Uh, with all the exposure girls get sure. on TV and things mm -hmm. like that. But at that time, it was, you know, uh, all the boys watch ESPN and want to try everything they see. Right. Uh, the girls just listen to what you tell them. Yeah. And they don't have any wild ideas about what they can or can't do. <laughs> They're relying on you to tell them. Yeah. So I had a blast doing it. I had some really good girls, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of fun. Uh, I don't regret it a, b uh, a bit. Do, do you then? Do you have to change? Did you have to change your your coaching mentality to coach girls? Well, I, you know, I kind of had them over a barrel because they didn't have anybody else. Right, right. And I remember calling the girls down to the music room. Mm -hmm. the music teacher was on her prep period. And that was that was an open room, and I called them down there and I said, "You need to think about if you want me to do this or not." Mm -hmm. Of course, I'd had them all in class. And right. And I said, because I, I won't coach you any different than I coach the boys. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to pat you on the rear end, yeah. and I'm not going to uh, do some things that, that happen with the boys' right. program. Right. But as far as coaching you, I'm not coaching you any different. Mm -hmm. And they were all for that, and I, I don't think I changed much. I mean, there's certainly some things you have to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I had a couple really good assistant coaches. One was a female, mm -hmm. and she could take care of all the <laughs> locker room drama and all that. And I, I was glad to let her have it. Yeah. You you mentioned Gary Merrill. Talk about the coaches that kind of influenced you. Well, certainly Coach Merrill. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, we still do a lot of things that we did in his practices and in his program. His idea of the way to do things was to, you know, create – a way or a culture of how you're going to go about every day mm -hmm. and you know we had I still have the Lombardi rule yeah and that's uh, a rule where if practice starts at three you're there by quarter till three mm -hmm. if the bus leaves at five you're there by quarter till five mm -hmm. so you and I still have players from the past you know I'll see them and they'll say hey never been late to never been late to work coach I'm on the Lombardi rule <laughs> but I mean little things like that right that were just ways of doing things have been really beneficial with him and mm -hmm. and then guys you coach against um you know I, I coached against a guy named charlie dembo at orleans who didn't get a lot of recognition but he's in the hall of fame now mm -hmm. and he was an outstanding coach um i think you just meet people along the way that you coach against and with sometimes mm -hmm. um that you kind of form your way of doing things and you know you change over the years sure i think you you add and subtract things that are good and bad but mm -hmm. it's good to be around southern indiana coaches because they're very dedicated mm -hmm. Uh, they're very hard to coach against. They, everybody takes it seriously. Right. So it's a good way to uh, stay up to date. You look at, at uh, the game over the course of the, the years you've been coaching, and there's always the discussion on who changes. Is it the game? Is it the players? Is it the coaches? How how's the game changed in the course of the last 20 or 30 years? Well, it's more than anything just from a speed factor. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, the game has really – gotten a lot quicker on both ends of the floor just in how you do things mm -hmm. um, that's probably the biggest thing I think for us with the three-point line yeah that spreads the floor a lot more than it used to right I and mean, used to you could really pack defenses in mm -hmm. against big players and now it's kind of hard to do that right it's changed really with college uh, more than anything mm -hmm. but Probably the biggest thing other than that would be exposure. I mean, yeah. Just the way kids are able to – well, I, I, I've got an eighth grader named Henry Grody, and mm -hmm. I was asking him about his shoes the other day, if he was a Laker fan. They were purple. I uh -huh. said, are you a Laker fan? He goes, yeah. I said, do you watch the Lakers a lot? And he said, yeah, i got an NBA pass on my phone. <laughs> so, I mean, here you got guys that are using their phones mm -hmm. to watch the NBA right. whenever they want to watch it. Right. And, you know, used to. Yeah. We would watch the game of the week, or you know, something <laughs> yep, like that. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's a big thing. It's it's so popular now mm -hmm. that it's it's changed how kids play and and how interested they are. Coach, let's uh, let's talk about um, 
and it, I think we kind of hit on it. You have a little bit, but you know the game has changed a little bit. Do, do you change your year to year how you f your philosophies of the game by the personnel that you have, or do you kind of hold true to your philosophies and try to mold the personnel to that? Well, I think you do both. Mm -hmm. I think you try to stay as close to what you've done that has been good for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you you always have to gear things to what you have, right? Uh, talent wise, you know, if you've got a if you got a good big kid, you have to find ways to incorporate him in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have uh, uh, big kids mm -hmm. and you're small uh, around the horn, then you have to do some things differently. But you know, when you've coached a while, you've faced all that. Right. And so you have hopefully something in the bag <laughs> for whatever you've got. Right. Um, but it is a lot like it's a lot like trick or treat, man. You just reach in there and see what comes out. Um, you know, I know you're going to ask me about players, and I know a little about some of my players. But sure. I just got my soccer players two weeks ago. Sure. So Monday morning will be the first real yeah. view of everybody. Right. But, yeah, I, I think you just have to adapt. If you go into a season saying you're going to run everything and do everything the same way you did last season mm -hmm. to a T, mm -hmm. you're shortchanging yourself and your right. kids. You have to adapt to what they can do. Mm -hmm. And and you, you take a, a, a kid, too, that comes in or a group of kids. Uh, you may see something as a coach, I would think, that you would like for them to do or get to a point where they can do. And it's it's the coach and the coaching staff to develop them to that point. It is, and I think your your plan going in has to be kind of built around that, mm -hmm. where you're sh you're sure that you're covering all those bases with right. the personnel you have. Um, we have a preseason checklist. It's about three pages long, and it starts with fast break mm -hmm. and what we need to cover before the first game, and then it goes to man offense, zone offense, out of bounds. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing on the list is is uh, how we act in a locker room, mm -hmm. what happens on the bench when you sub in and out. Mm -hmm. And basically, I go through and highlight those every day. Mm -hmm. We got to cover something now with right. two weeks to get ready before a game. Sure, we have to cover one or two things almost every day. So you have to adapt to your timetable and your and your kids and what you want to try to get done. You you don't leave just kind of based on what you just told me. You don't leave a whole lot of of gray area for the kids. Everything is pretty much laid out for them. I think so. Uh, you know, there can be some gray area uh, mm -hmm. at times sure. later. Yeah. Um, the best thing I was ever told leaving college as a teacher or going to be a teacher mm -hmm. was that you can start out tough and lighten up, but you can never start out light and toughen up. And I think that goes with about everything. Yeah. Parenting. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just think you have to have expectations. Mm -hmm from all your kids and your team mm -hmm. and your coaches right on on what your philosophy is and and how you're going to do things and I, I think you have to be pretty strict about that at least to begin with and there's not probably a lot of gray area you you tell me in an interview we did a couple of years ago when I when we did a basketball game when you were at Dearborn that you like rebuilding programs you like building from the ground up and going uh, upward Shaw obviously they've had some struggles good challenge it is and and it's uh I do like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I guess I've had some times where I've had pretty good talent, uh, but I've never really looked for jobs that had everybody coming back. Right. You know, uh, right. to me, it's more fun uh, on a daily basis to take things that haven't been good mm -hmm. and try to make them good. And I think you get more reward out of that. Yeah. Um, and they've been down. I mean, there's no yeah. doubt. It's It was really hard on Phil trying to do two jobs at once. Right. And I think they were left in a tough spot when he had to take it over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our conversations really were that he wanted to make sure he put it in some kind of good hands and not just give it to anybody. And right. I think that's a credit to him. Sure. So numbers have been down. Mm -hmm. we got to get those back up. Uh, they're up a little bit already mm -hmm. through the high school. Um, but 
you know, it's a, a thing where you come in every day mm -hmm. and just try to get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Our job right now, and, and one of our big themes, is to be relevant. Mm -hmm. We just want to be part of it. Right. And uh, if we can play hard and let people leave the gym knowing that we've given full effort mm -hmm. and uh, start there, I think that's that's a good place. You, and I know because I, I, I coach at Shaw, but for those that don't know, and most coaches will go into the lower programs to try to, to, to build the feeder program, something you focus on as well. You have to start there. Mm -hmm. And even at a school the size of Shaw that is not very big, you have to start at kindergarten mm -hmm. or before right I mean anymore yeah uh, we've got about 20 kids that are going to play in the boys club league mm -hmm. we're also going to work with all those 20 kids on our own mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to start there probably probably the the two greatest things in my mind coaching wise uh, that we've been able to get done is uh, when I went to Paoli the kids that were in the second and third grade class there were the ones who went to the state finals mm -hmm. as seniors. Right. And then at Crawford County, who went to the state finals this year, mm -hmm. um, those guys were in about the same grades. Right. So, you know, you start there and, and try to build up. Uh, you do the best you can with your older kids. Mm -hmm. What I tell my seniors sometimes is you're not going to see the fruits of this, mm -hmm. but you'll be able to come back and see it. Right. And that can be a big prideful thing for you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you got to start at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ray Black and I go way back. I've known him for a long time. Yeah. I told him when we met about the Boys Club League, I said, I'm turning my kids over to you uh -huh. part time. Right. They're yours to do what you want with, mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll add some input to that mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you're doing everything for us we're right. going to have our own programs and try to kind of double up a little bit where we can work a lot with our kids and i just think you have to have them in the gym all the time yeah i mean just year round now yeah. you and as a coach and, and and some coaches approach differently some coaches they 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 don't they're not as much involved with the feeder program they they are involved but not as much right. I, I feel like it, you you got to be really involved in order to again you you mentioned Paoli and those guys coming up as seniors and playing for the state championship. That's that's what a coach has to do. You do, and, and I I think it's a fun part mm -hmm. when you when you can go to an elementary game as a varsity coach mm -hmm. and the ball goes out of bounds under the basket it's your ball and they call out one of the out of bounds plays that your high school team's running uh -huh. uh, there's a lot to that yeah and when you come in camp in the summer and you call out a drill and the kids already know the name mm -hmm. and they already know how to line up mm -hmm. man you save a lot of time right when they get to the high school level then you can really focus on the best things mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where we're at at Shaw we you know I went to a junior high practice yesterday and we talked about our press offense and mm -hmm. it's the same one that our high school team will run. Mm -hmm. So I guess if, if you're a high school coach and you want to see what we're going to do, go to an elementary. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick up some secrets sure. there. Coach, you know, you, you're, you'll start practice bright and early Monday morning. I know you're looking forward to officially getting things rolling, but as you mentioned, it's kind of a short stint from first day of practice to game number one. Well, we start on Monday. And uh, we have about eight or ten practices before we go and, and yeah. scrimmage, and then mm -hmm. two days later we play. Yeah. So for us, it's going to be a lot of installment mm -hmm. of what we want to try to do. Right. And then once we get to our weeks where we have a game on the weekend and we've got a full week of practice, then I think we'll be able to really break things down and make it better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to require a lot of patience on my part. Sure. And I understand that. Yeah. But the one thing that we do have that I have found is that we have great kids. Yeah. That are good listeners. Mm -hmm. They're very good students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it'll it'll be a, a big chore getting the basics in for them. Right. But that's what we got to do first. Do you uh, do you guys will you spend a lot of time watching film after games? Mm -hmm. uh, we will. And, you know, a lot depends on how close your games are together. Sure. But if we have uh, a day off after a game, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll practice light, mm -hmm. and we'll come in and, and watch film of mm -hmm. that game and break it down. Uh, sometimes I have my kids keep their own stats mm -hmm. and so they can literally see what sure. they have gotten done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we tell kids in, in film is when you're watching yourself especially, 
uh, it's all about numbers. Mm -hmm. What you don't want is a blank sheet. You want some deflections, some rebounds. You may have a turnover or two, mm -hmm. but that means you're involved in the game. Right. And that's uh, that's what you want to see. As far as preparation for other teams, we'll watch some tape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can get a lot out of that. It's a lot easier to see it on film and then go out and work against it than right. it is to just try to explain it on the floor. I've had coaches tell me that when they're preparing for, for an opponent, uh, we're not really too concerned about what they do. We just want to take care of ourselves. And some coaches, you know, we want to prepare for some of the things they're going to do. How, what's your approach with it? I think you try to take a few big things away. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, where they start their offense, where they start their break, uh, maybe their their best two or three out of bounds plays. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're if you're looking at playing on a Saturday and you don't have anything all week, I think you can do more. Sure. And then. On the other hand, if you play Friday and come back on Saturday, you have about an hour right. to go through just a couple things. Mm -hmm. I do think both are true. You have to concern with yourself. yourself. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you're coaching high school basketball in southern Indiana and you don't have a clue what they're doing, mm -hmm. you're going to be exposed pretty quick. Pretty quick. So you better have some idea of what's coming, especially in important parts of the game. Right. You start out the season, you'll be at Medora, then New Washington, Southwestern, uh, Columbus Christian, South Ripley. You're playing in the ORVC. Uh, some, some tough conference games, some tough non-conference games. Uh, it's not an easy schedule schedule no and I, I think it's a good schedule mm -hmm. um, you're you're not going to be ready for tournament play if you have not played teams better than the ones in your tournament right and we've always said that uh, when I was at Paoli we scrimmaged B&L yeah that was our scrimmage yeah. and I told our kids on the way home on the bus you won't face better pressure than that all the way through mm -hmm. because they're a 4a school right so I think you you want to play some of those schools that are up and, and have good programs and maybe a little bigger than you. And, boy, when you can compete with them, mm -hmm. then you know going into your sectional that you've got a, a, a shot because you played just as good. Right. And you, you – to get a team prepared to play that first game, first season, first game, uh, you're going to have a little nerves. People are going to – you know, you, there's going to be mistakes to be made. And you mentioned patience, and I think that's a good point. One of the things coaches have to have in building a program is a whole lot of patience. You do. And, and it's funny because I think coaches are some of the most impatient people <laughs> you'll ever meet. <laughs> so we must be pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, I'm not a patient person, yeah. but I realize that you know you have to know what your capabilities are mm -hmm. and you have to know where you're at as far as your kids understanding mm -hmm. of what you're doing um, then I think you can be really impatient after you get past that right so it, it involves a lot to begin with for sure do you do you have in a typical situation season after season at the, at the same school do you have goals that you set for your team yeah, uh, you know, I think it depends on your team. Mm -hmm. uh, some obviously are going to be higher than others, depending on who you have coming back and what right. experience level you are. Uh, but I, uh, if you don't have things on your board and in your mind that you want to accomplish, then you know you're running around the wagon most yeah. of the year. Yeah. You know, what do we want to do? Well, uh, Coach Merrill's rule was we want to have a winning season, mm -hmm. we want to win the conference, and we want to win the sectional. Yeah. And you know, I've had teams that that was our goal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it was uh, less than that, and sometimes it was more. Right. But I, I think your kids have to have a big understanding of what you want to try to accomplish. As a coach, you always want the effort to be at the top of the line, 100%, 110%, whatever, whatever phase and focus you use. Do you accept anything less than 110%? Well, I, I think when you start doing that, mm -hmm. that's what you're going to get. Right. Um, I think you have to expect the highest level mm -hmm. of effort. And it, once you get to there, mm -hmm. then the other things become a little bit easier. Right. But I think if you accept laziness and tardiness and things that are going to hurt kids, later in life mm -hmm. then I think you you know you're gonna get what you get you're right. gonna get guys walking in whenever they want to come mm -hmm. um, you're gonna get kids that when uh, things are tough they back away right and and that's something we won't do right and and I think you have to let them know that and as a coaching staff I think you have to do that right. I don't think you sit and pout when you're down I mm -hmm. think you coach right uh, one thing that's always bothered me uh, is seeing coaches that are down 20 and they're sitting on the bench with their legs crossed. Mm -hmm. you know, 
coach them. Right. You know, it doesn't mean you don't finish the game out. Right. And I, I, you know, if you want your kids to do that, I think you have to do that. Right. But I think that's a big thing is just what your expectations are from, from everybody. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, and for an example, if you're 20 or 30 points down, there's no better time to coach than a game situation. It is. You can get a lot done. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I've done it. Yeah. You can get a lot done. You can work with different lineups. You can uh, maybe try something that you've worked on in practice that you sure. don't know if you're ready for. Sure. You know, it's if you're down 20 points in the fourth quarter and, and you're obviously not as good as the team you're playing, it almost becomes, say, an eight-minute practice right. for you. Sure. And you can get a ton out of that. Right. Now, who wouldn't want, as a coach, to have teams come in and practice against them. Mm -hmm. So it becomes that. And, yeah. you know, if you're up coaching and, and your coaches are coaching and involved in the game, then your kids will be. Right. But uh, I think you can get a lot out of winning and losing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's more fun to win. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we want to do. Right. But there are times where you can get a lot out of, out of both. And you mentioned numbers improving. Uh, numbers are probably never where any coach wants them to be at most times, but numbers are going to improving, and it's kind of a work in progress. It is. We're 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 up a few kids mm -hmm. from last year, and we only have one freshman yeah. that, that's playing. And that's our really small class right now. It looks like we're going to have – anywhere from two to four seniors, uh, two to four juniors, a uh, bunch of sophomores, mm -hmm. and one freshman. Yeah. And our classes behind that are not bad at all. Mm -hmm. We need to keep those numbers up sure. and then build from the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I told our elementary coaches the other day, we have 20 guys that are going to play in the Boys Club League. When they're seventh graders, I want 20 guys in right. those two classes. Sure. So we don't want to lose any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're playing at the lower levels, it's about fun and fundamentals. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. If your kid enjoys it and he's learning something along the way, mm -hmm. then you're going to keep them. Right. So for us, it's it's going this year. We're going to be young, mm -hmm. really young, and maybe younger next year. Right. Um, but there's nothing wrong with young. Yeah. They're coming back. They got to learn. Yeah. They got to learn. Yeah. Coach, our time is up. We appreciate coming in this morning. I've, it's, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I like to pick the brains of veteran coaches because it's, it's, it's kind of neat to hear what, what path you've taken to get you to where you're at right now. So we appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. It's, uh, it's fun to talk about basketball regardless. Regardless. That's right. Coach Mike Brown from Shaw Memorial in this morning on Coach's Corner. Again, the Hilltoppers open up November the 21st at Medora. They will uh, host New Washington coming up on November the 25th. That's it from Coach's Corner. I want to thank A.J. Bramer in studio. I want to thank Coach Mike Brown for being with us this morning. Don't forget uh, Kentucky Anna News. Of course, uh, we'll be, they filmed this. We'll be having it on our Facebook page. We appreciate uh, them coming in. You can watch all the good happenings here at McDonald's from today's program coming up uh, late tomorrow afternoon. I'm Tim Torrance. Until next week at Coach's Corner here on Works 96.7.